Welcome to the Manton Foundation Annual Rosco Lecture at the Hood Museum of Art. My name is Armando Polito, and I graduated from Dartmouth in 2019 with a double major in art history and Latin American and Caribbean studies. I participated in the Hood Museum's internship program from the fall of 2018 to the spring of 2019, where I had the opportunity to curate a space for dialogue exhibition titled Los Mojados, Migrant Bodies and Latinx Identities. I am currently a curatorial assistant at the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art in Los Angeles, currently under construction. <laughs> During my time at Dartmouth, I had the incredible opportunity to take two courses with Professor Tatiana Reynosa, which focused on Latinx art and activism and borderlands art and theory. Aside from being a wonderful, wonderful professor, Tatiana also was and still is a generous mentor who guided me during my time at Dartmouth and beyond. It is with great pleasure that I help introduce her to the stage today. There will be a Q&A near the end of the program and we invite you to contribute your questions then. At this time, I'd like, I'd like to ask everyone to turn off their cell phones or set them on silent mode. Please note the emergency exit to my left and those at the back of the auditorium. Um, it is now my pleasure to invite Alex Bordelot, Deputy Director of the Hood Museum of Art, to the podium. Well, th thank you, Armando. It's been fun to get to meet you just, just now, and I hope to uh, hear more about what you're doing and your time at Dartmouth after after the lecture. Um, well, as Armando said, my name is Alex Borlaud. I'm the Hood's Deputy Director. Um, welcome. It's wonderful to see you all here tonight. Um, uh, I want to start off with our land acknowledgement. The Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth is situated upon the ancestral lands of the Abenaki people. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of indigenous people, and the museums and Dartmouth's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. Tonight, we are pleased to present this year's installment in our series of annual lectures that revolve around the Epic of American Civilization, the internationally recognized mural by Jose Clemente Orozco, located on the ground level of the Dartmouth College Library. These lectures have been made possible by an endowment funded by the Manton Foundation, which promotes scholarship on and provides care and conservation for the Orozco mural at Dartmouth. We would like to express our gratitude to the Manton Foundation for their ongoing support of these amazing murals. I also can't resist any opportunity I have to plug the Hood's current exhibition, Printing the Revolution, The Rise and Impact of Chicano Graphics, 1965 to Now, organized by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Here at the Hood, the exhibition was ably curated by Jonathan Little Cohen, Associate Curator of American Art, Michael Hartman, who I've, I'm not sure if he's here tonight, um, and Beatrice Giannis Martinez, who is here tonight, um, Hood Board of Advisors Mutual Learning Fellow. Um, if you have not seen the exhibition, please do so before it closes June 17th. It's really wonderful. Um, so it is now my pleasure to introduce Mary Coffey, Professor of Art History and Affiliated Professor in Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean Studies programs. Professor Coffey specializes in the history of modern Mexican visual culture with an emphasis on Mexican muralism and the politics of exhibition. Please join me in welcoming Professor Coffey, who will introduce this evening's speaker. This feels a little bit like a family reunion, <laughs> so thank you Armando for opening the event for us and thanks Alex for this uh, introduction and I wanted to welcome everyone as well to what I believe is the 13th annual Manton Family Endowed Lecture. And before I say a few words of introduction about my good friend and colleague and our esteemed speaker, Professor Tatiana Reynosa, I want to take a moment to express my personal gratitude to the Manton family. Just this week, the college is celebrating the end of a call to lead, which is a multi-year capital campaign that has increased the coffers and provided targeted funding for new initiatives. So it seems particularly important in this moment to thank those alumni and donors who seek to fund existing resources, both institutional and human, to build build upon underutilized strengths, um, as well as adding new things for us to shepherd into the future. And it's particularly commendable uh, that when seeking ways to support the college, the Manton family chose to support the library and the museum to honor the legacy of Jose Clemente Orozco's time at the college and to recognize and support humanities and interdisciplinary research at a time when a lot of our energy is focused on other institutional priorities. So I wanna thank them again from the bottom of my heart and for all that the family's endowments allow us to do. And foremost among those things is of course the opportunity annually to identify a prominent scholar 
whose work reflects the political ethos and artistic legacy of Jose Clemente Orozco's mural, The Epic of American Civilization, painted at Dartmouth between 1932 and 1934. This year, I'm so very pleased to welcome back Professor Tatiana Reynosa to celebrate the publication of her two books and to honor her achievements as one of the foremost scholars of Latinx print culture while we are hosting the critically acclaimed exhibition Printing the Revolution, the Rise and Impact of Chicano Graphics, 1965 to Now, to which she contributed a fantastic essay. We invited Professor Reynosa to give this year's lecture in part to capitalize on the exhibition and support the many Dartmouth courses that are making use of it this spring. But we also invited her because we consider her a valued member of our community, as she spent three years at the college as part of the inaugural cohort of the, what was then the brand new uh, Society of Fellows. While here, she taught courses on the art of the borderlands and Latinx art and activism, which Armando took, and while also undertaking the process of converting her dissertation into her innovative monograph entitled Reclaiming the Americas, Latinx Art, and the Politics of Territory, published this spring by University of Texas Press and available now at Still North Books. Professor Reynosa completed both her MA and PhD at the University of Texas at Austin, and after her postdoc at Dartmouth, she moved on to Notre Dame University, where she is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Art, Art History, and Design. And although for the past year she has been a research fellow at the Getty Research Institute, one of the most coveted and competitive fellowships available to art historians. In addition to her monograph, she has also just published Self-Help Graphics at 50, a cornerstone of Latinx art and collaborative art making at University of California Press. This too is available at Still North Books. This volume is co-edited with Karen Mary Davalos and includes beautifully illustrated essays with some of the most significant scholars of Latinx art working today. It provides a much needed overview and reframing of the achievements of one of the longest running and most influential community-based visual arts centers and print ateliers in the history of Chicano arts. And as these essays reveal, self-help originated in the Chicano civil rights movement, but from its origins, it has provided resources to communities in LA through its mobile print shop, supported inter-ethnic and international collaborations between artists of various Latin American diasporas, worked intersectionally with artists from other non-Latinx communities, and provided technical expertise to artists from all over the Americas seeking to develop their own printmaking skills. Alongside these two major publications, she's published numerous peer-reviewed and award-winning essays, curated exhibitions, and worked to elevate the experiences and the counter-archival practices of artists who've endured the displacements and violence of war, whether as enlisted fighters in overseas wars or the war at home uh, against racialized minorities in the United States, or as victims of the drug wars in Mexico or US-backed civil war in El Salvador. She's currently working on a second monograph provisionally titled Retorno, uh, Art and Kinship in the Making of a Central American Diaspora. This project is at once very personal, but also part of a groundswell of Central American studies taking place today due to the art, poetry, and scholarship of members of the 1.5 generation of immigrants from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. I would be remiss if I did not mention her membership in the Association of Print Scholars and on the National Advisory Committee at Artura.org. Finally, Tatiana is a dear friend and valued colleague whose personal integrity and genuine expressions of relational ethics cannot be undervalued. She came to Dartmouth on a fellowship to support her professional development, but she left this institution a better place due to her conscientious contributions to the Society of Fellows, her passionate labors at the Hood Museum of Art, where she helped to significantly increase the representation of Latinx art in the collection, and her mentorship to students like Armando. I know that I personally learned a lot about how to support students inside and outside of the classroom from Tatiana, and I'm currently teaching a course that would have been impossible for me were it not for her willingness to share ideas, syllabi, PDFs, and most importantly, encouragement. <laughs> Her talk today is drawn from the first chapter of Reclaiming the Americas, and if you are intrigued by what she has to say, I encourage you to cross Main Street and purchase the book, because every chapter provides a, a deep dive into several works of printmaking to illuminate the conceptual sophistication, technical mastery, and historical intersections of Latinx artists who are critically interrogating the role of print culture in advancing settler colonial projects in the Americas. 
She shows how their work engages in a decolonial aesthetic that seeks to unsettle representations, boundaries, and borders across the Americas without shying away from an interrogation of the ways that ethno-nationalisms can reproduce colonial ideologies of indigenous dispossession and anti-black concepts of identity. So please join me in welcoming Tatiana Reynosa to the podium to present From Terra Nova to Aslan, The Politics of Territory in Latinx Printmaking. There will be time for questions after her talk. Well, that was such a generous introduction. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to thank the Hood Museum for this kind invitation to return to Dartmouth and present my research. I'm especially grateful to Amelia Call, Sharon Reed for helping to arrange my visit. Um, I also want to thank Beatriz Yanez Martinez for walking me through the Printing the Revolution exhibition this morning. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Society of Fellows and the Department of Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean Studies, especially Marcela Di Blasi, Matt Garcia, Israel Reyes, and my friend and femtor, Mary Coffey, for helping make this book a reality. It's, wonder to, it's wonderful to celebrate its publication with you today. So I'm going to begin my talk with a clip from a pilot episode of a show called Mad Men, which some of you might remember. And in this episode, Don Draper and his colleagues are desperately trying to come up with a campaign that can mask the recently discovered health impacts of cigarettes from the Surgeon General. It's an iconic scene in which viewers are drawn into the 1960s world of advertising, a world of images in which we are made privy to how they appeal to consumers' emotions while concealing a great deal of information about these products. When the CEO of Lucky Strike, Lee Garner Sr., exclaims, are you insane? I'm not selling rifles, I'm selling America. The Indians gave it to us for shit's sake. He reveals the ideological underpinnings of what will become one of the most successful ad campaigns for Leo Burnett, the Chicago agency that inspired the TV show Mad Men. The popular ad campaign known as Marlboro Man was based on panoramic vistas of the West, often with rugged cowboys on horseback. These chisel-faced wranglers were seen on television commercials, massive-scale billboards, and full-color magazine spreads. Against a backdrop of red rock deserts or high plains, these men invoked a nostalgic return to the 19th century frontier, a time of intense territorial expansion that required clearing the land of indigenous peoples in order to fulfill the quest of manifest destiny. In the 1990s, when big tobacco was under fire over legal disputes for marketing an addictive substance to children and refusing their responsibility in a public health crisis that led to innumerable deaths, the Los Angeles-based artist Ricardo Duffy returned to this campaign. But in Duffy's print, the serene Marlboro landscape of cowboys and campfires becomes monstrous, a site filled with surveillance, fleeing, and ultimately death. Duffy draws on the mythology of Westerns, which informed the aesthetics of Marlboro campaigns, but he flips the heroic portrayals of the cowboy by connecting the figure to the Border Patrol. His large screen print, published by Self Help Graphics in East Los Angeles, emulates the two page magazine spreads or panoramic billboards. The colors are overly saturated in a composition that is intricately layered with the sun-kissed mountains of Monument Valley in the background, a Ford Bronco and caution sign midway, and the commanding bus portrait of George Washington, who looks toward the viewer. The Bronco, Spanish for a wild or half-tamed horse, is one of the Mexican elements on which the figure of the American cowboy was conceived. In this panoramic vista, the Border Patrol's Ford Bronco and a silhouetted cowboy ride along a ridge made of skulls and bones. Unlike the barren desert in the Marlboro commercials that make up the image of Manifest Destiny, 
Duffy's monstrous country evinces the death and displacement of indigenous populations and the contemporary forms of tracking and rounding up undocumented immigrants like animals. I open this talk with these contested image histories because they get at many of the debates in my book. Why do Latinx artists turn to territorial representations? Why do they use the reproductive medium of printmaking? What do their claims to land mean in relation to, to their complex identities? How do they speak to the lived experience of migration in the context of growing anti-immigrant discourse? How can these alternative representations of territoriality shift how we perceive space, borders, and belonging in the 21st century? In this lecture, I want to do a deep dive into the work of three artists who are featured in my book, Ricardo Duffy, Sandra Fernandez, and Michael Menchaca. Fernandez and Menchaca are also prominently represented in Printing the Revolution, the show that is currently um, up here at the hood and was curated by Carmen Ramos and Claudia Zapata. Therefore, I'd like to spend some time contextualizing how the work of these artists is part of a larger intergenerational print network that we see take shape throughout this exhibition. To be here at Dartmouth College and in the presence of one of Jose Clemente Orozco's masterpieces, The Epic of American Civilization, provides another opportunity to extend their intellectual genealogies further back in time and to position them as part of a hemispheric tradition of resistance and anti-colonial art in the Americas. Through the work of Duffy, Fernandez, and Menchaca, I will demonstrate how their use of printmaking counters nativist and xenophobic discourses while also critiquing the medium's historical complicity in the colonization of the Americas. I'll conclude by thinking about their desire to build a politics of territory for Latinx peoples in the US and what that says about our current political moment. The artists in this study employ four different approaches to delinking from Western conceptions of territory. If the West viewed land in economic terms and that land was inhabited by those they deemed savage and racially inferior, Latinx artists have invoked those subject positions through a deployment of indigeneity, embodiment, and racial mixing. Native territorialities is perhaps the most common of these approaches and draws from the indigenous heritage of Latinx artists. Most artists of Latin American descent possess ties and some would argue direct bloodlines to native cultures, and yet that connection has been obscured over time or denigrated through racialization. The Bay Area poster artist Jesus Barraza explains in his writing, quote, as Chicana indigena people, we have been able to recover some of what was lost over the centuries. We are people living in diaspora who have been detribalized and deterritorialized, searching for our origins, end quote. From this position, Latinx artists enunciate other ways of seeing that confront hidden processes that invented Europe's discovery of the new world. But these enunciations and images can at times negate the claims to ancestral lands and the living presence of contemporary Native American groups. And Chicanx artists have long accessed spiritual geographies to stake a claim for sovereignty in the lands of the Southwest. And the New Order similarly deploys myth in the service of Native land rights. In an interview, when asked about the Mountain of Skulls in the New Order, Duffy mentioned how the theme of death references Apache Leap. The latter is a red bluff peak in the Pinal Mountains east of Superior, Arizona. Legend has it that the Apaches held an outpost on this mountaintop from which they would launch raids against the white settlers, especially the farming community of Florence, which edged into Apache land. In the 1870s, the federal government sent assistance to these families in the form of a military post led by Army Colonel George Stoneman. Stoneman's troops used heliograph signals with sunlight and mirrors to scout the trails leading to the Indian lookout. Once they were located, the army launched a military offensive. The surprise assault on the surrounded encampment left the Apache warriors at the edge of a fatal cliff. Rather than surrender, legend claims the Apaches leap to their deaths, the lore from which is coined the cliff's foreboding title. 
Without a doubt, the white settlers of Arizona led punitive expeditions to kill and displace the Apaches from this region, perhaps underscoring the value of the land, home to a prominent mining district that included the Silver Queen and Silver King mines, as well as the Magma Copper Mine. But the story of Apache warriors leaping to their deaths is likely part of a Depression-era folklore invested in attracting tourists to Superior especially given that other 19th century Arizona Indian massacres were greatly boasted about. The folktale retold again and again attracted tourists craving for a view of the 19th century Western frontier. But the question for us is, why would Duffy revert to the use of this myth? How could colonizing the myth of the colonizers relieve the injustices, injustices of westward expansion? How could Apache Leap, as seen from this Marlboro billboard, comment on the current immigration crisis? Historian Richard Slotkin, who has studied the development of, Western, of the Western film genre, explains that, quote, myths are stories drawn from society's history that have acquired through persistent usage the power of symbolizing that society's ideology and of dramatizing its moral consequences with all the complexities and contradictions that consciousness may contain, end quote. Duffy appears to focus on those contradictions and to place in question their moralizing rhetoric. In this work, Duffy rehearsed the history of land dispossession to probe the ideologies that support its xenophobic laws, such as California's Proposition 187. The ballot initiative of 1994, known as the Save Our State campaign, spearheaded by a group of Orange County right-wing activists, barred undocumented immigrants from accessing public services, including education and non-emergency health care, and mandated schools and health aides to turn in those suspected of being in the country without papers. The initiative gained widespread support, especially from the Republican Party and Governor Pete Wilson's re-election campaign. Despite strong opposition from pro-immigrant activist groups, public marches, and student walkouts, the ballot measure passed by a majority 59%. The vote signaled the consolidation of California's anti-immigrant platform, which represented a nativist sentiment that would reverberate throughout the country in the coming years. To the right of Washington, Duffy names the ballot law among a mound of skeletons. The calaveras appear to come alive on his coat. One wears a bandana inscribed Chicano, the politicized Mexican-American nomer the artist uses to self-identify, while another sticks his head out beyond the boundaries of the coat. Native accoutrements surround the calaveras, an ax, an arrow, a feathered headdress on the left, a peace pipe, and a rattlesnake on the right. Duffy's print suggests that the land was never terra nullius, but rather was cleared of native others, and moreover, that the belief in a God-given right to come, see, and conquer, and you'll recall that Veni Vidi Vici once graced the Marlboro corporate logo, are the same ones that motivate nativist movements like Proposition 187. Duffy also had a biographical connection to this landscape. His mother, Elizabeth Ann Rodriguez, was a descendant of the Chiricahua Apache Nation, which once ruled a vast territory in what is now the borderlands of New Mexico, Arizona, Sonora, and Chihuahua. She returned to live in Superior, just west of the San Carlos Reservation. Duffy's visits to the area and their ancestral connection sparked his interest in a native worldview. After a bloody war, when the Apaches officially surrendered to the U.S. Army in 1886, they lost more than their land. Entire families were detained and relocated to Fort Marion, Florida, becoming prisoners for more than two decades. From Fort Marion, the families were transferred to Alabama and eventually to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, until their release in 1913. While the logic of westward expansion and capitalism demanded their land and, quite frankly, their annihilation, the Chiricahua people and their language, customs, song, and dance endured. In their story of resilience and survival, Duffy found parallels to the native immigrants from southern Mexico and Central America, clamoring for entry at the southern border. By 1963, when Philip Morris launched the Marlboro Country Campaign with its focus on the cowboy and western landscape, the figure of the Indian had already vanished 
from their image repertoire. Ironically, the white male cowboy had to adopt Indian ways to tame the West, had to perform a generic Indianness to clear the land of the indigenous and barbarous. The racialized geography of Marlboro country thus builds on the desire of a free land gifted to the colonists. So you remember that clip, the Indians gave it to us for shit's sake. A sublime terrain conquered by non-indigenous white men. Duffy juxtaposes that racialized geography of the Indian with the history of Western expansion that required the dispossession and extermination of indigenous people. His cowboy rides atop the mountain of skulls where his heels touch the myth of Apache Leap, the skirmish in which, according to lore, the US cavalry watched the desperate Indians fall to their deaths. To rid Indian savagery from Marlboro country, the colonists justified the expendable nature of the indigenous subjects and later reified that view through a story that claimed their rightful possession to Apache land. To use the myth of Apache land, of Apache leap against the image of manifest destiny is humorous and witty, but one must also consider how the narrative of settler colonialism informs the mythos of Aslan. For artists and theorists, Amalia Mesa Baines, quote, the powerful symbol of Aslan as an ancestral homeland emanated from the deep Chicana and Chicano sense of dislocation and deterritorialization experienced in the aftermath of the Mexican-American War, which resulted in the annexation by the United States of the Northern Territories of Mexico, as well as earlier Spanish colonial invasion. End quote. Oh, sorry, lost my place there. The geographical utopia of Aslan, which emerged from the history of territorial loss and a sense of powerlessness, invents a direct link to a pre-Columbian past, rooting itself in the indigenous traditions of Mexico while appropriating North American indigenous territories. In the new order, Aslan also takes possession of the Southwest, mimicking the settler colonialism that grabbed this land and repopulating it with uncanny Indians. The indigenous are a simulation of those who perished in the fight for Apache land and those Chicanos who later appropriated that trauma and reenacted the loss in their mythical homeland. According to Josie Saldana Portillo, Chicano Aslan is a space produced through the melancholic incorporation of lost indigeneity. Duffy, Duffy is luckier than most Chicanos in that his family can trace its lineage to the Apache, not merely a generic Indianness. But the multiracial artist is many generations separated from an indigenous specificity. His print speaks of a psychic longing, what Saldana Portillo, Portillo calls a Chicano racial unconscious, that makes those who are racially incomplete desire a lost indigenous past. One can speculate that this yearning is particularly acute for an artist who is not white enough nor Mexican enough to fit neatly into categories. This desire is so strong, the artist surely believes it to be true. He has willed it so. And I'm, I'm reading a quote from him. The reality because of Apache Leap, you know, the 16th Cavalry, all that history I've studied and knowing people from the San Carlos Reservation, which is where my mother used to live near Lake Superior. So here I am and I see this Marlboro thing and I go, holy macaroni moly. And they ran away from the 16th Cavalry. They didn't want to get captured, so the women and children jumped. That's pretty daring. The repressed loss creates a deep chasm dividing Chicanos from present day Native American nations. Apache Leap is not a mirror, but rather is a narrative of mythical power. Earlier, I had mentioned four different approaches to delinking from Western conceptions of territory, and now I'd like to turn our attention to some of these other modalities. Embodied territorialities is another approach that these artists use to confront Western conceptions of territory. The Western cartographic gaze often depends on disembodiment. For example, Mercator's atlas transforms the sphere spherical world into a flat, two-dimensional, and gridded surface. The geographer surrounds the continental land masses with bodies of water that are crisscrossed with innumerable diagonals whose points intersect in major navigational routes. Brief descriptions accompany each location, but the system of representation tells us little about Mercator's body. The precision of his lines and their measurements privilege visuality, the geographer's eye, as the one and only source of true knowledge. 
On the other hand, Latinx artists stress embodiment from the position of the border dweller. They work to articulate other ways of conceiving land through our senses that diverge from male Eurocentric subjectivity. Mestiza territorialities is an option that invokes land rights and belonging for those racially mixed subjects who are the progeny of colonial violence. These racial mixtures are undeniable for most Latinx artists who trace their roots to African, European, and indigenous ancestry. But we must also contend with the ideological roots of mestizaje. Theories of mestizaje, such as those espoused by Jose Vasconcelos, were likewise littered with problematic notions and often racist paradigms meant to devalue the lives of black and indigenous populations as they promoted racial mixing to better the race in the official discourse of Latin American states. However, the tactical use of mestizaje, specifically the mestiza consciousness of feminist and borderlands writers like Gloria Anzaldúa symbolically claim space for those subjects who by virtue of their immigration status have been left out of this imperial design. The Ecuadorian American artist Sandra Fernandez employs these modalities to contest the geography of the borderlands and the invisibility of undocumented immigrants. Her printmaking residencies at the Austin-based workshop Coronado Studio between 2008 and 2013 were transformational. As an artist mar marked by her own circular migration history, she was born in New York, raised in Quito, Ecuador, and returned to the US as a young adult Fernandez noticed how the modern American metropolis required undocumented immigrant labor, but insisted on making their presence invisible. This concern became the focus of a new body of work, in part fostered by Coronado Studios' Latinx artist community in East Austin and its popular residency program, City of Project. But Fernandez's concerns over invisibility also signaled the post 9-11 context that shifted the power of policing the border to every corner of the country through the deployment of immigration and customs enforcement, as well as a surging wave of deportations that peaked in 2012, forcing many undocumented residents into the shadows. Shortly after the Obama administration's executive order on DACA, Fernandez began making work on the Dreamers. The issue was of personal significance given that many of her students were direct beneficiaries of this policy. Caution, Dreamers in or on site shows the blue tinged portraits of these youth silk screened over a vintage port of entry map of the El Paso Juarez region. The US Geological Survey produced these maps in the early 1960s in cooperation with, customs, with US Customs. In the print, Fernandez contrasted the map's God's eye view of the international borderline, including the cadastre used to identify land parcels, with the faces of young people suddenly in the spotlight. The largest portrait on the left shows a young man looking directly at the viewer. At the center and suggestive of the print's title is the iconic road sign of a family crossing a highway. But the figures are flipped and run to the right. The sign is also present in Duffy's The New Order. Some of you may have noticed that. And um, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about the history of that sign during the Q&A if anyone is interested. Seven smaller portraits emerge on the right in a series of diagonals and overlaps that may suggest the growing movement of immigrant youth activism. The artist establishes a triangular composition with the flashpoint caution sign, a collage red, red aviary milagro, which is a Catholic folk charm, and a refashioned road sign in the upper right with three graduates running triumphantly with their diplomas. In this composition, the dreamers are staged front and center. Their unafraid gaze and solemn posture demands acknowledgement. Commenting on this shift, Tatiana Flores noted how the work ponders the ethics of representation. As Fernandez, quote, successfully humanizes a group of anonymous minors who have been victims of circumstances beyond their control, end quote. In such a view, Flores frames the intervention to elicit sympathy for these young people. But perhaps there's more at play in this strategy. By placing their portraits over the borderline, Fernandez challenged the disembodied projection of the port of entry map with the embodiment of the dreamers, whose corporeal presence blocks the line of sight. In fact, the subtitle of the work alludes to this maneuver. 
The strategy recalls the work of the late photographer Laura Aguilar, whose radically vulnerable nude self-portraits counter the frontier ideology of 19th century photographic practices. Writing on Aguilar's posthumous retrospective, Macarena Gomez Paris remarked, quote, by situating her mestiza body into the folds of land amid the boulders of the Gila Mountains, Aguilar calls forth the historical memory of Spanish colonialism, U.S. colonization, and settler violence, end quote. Much like Aguilar's ecological impulse to blend into the landscape and use her embodiment to resist the frontier belief in an empty, free land, Fernandez employs the mixed-race Latinx body to visually block the science of cartography used to demarcate territorial borders, as well as its political implications for which bodies may enter, exit, and live beyond these entry points. This shift toward corporeality, forcing the viewer to see those bodies that are prohibited or forbidden, recalls the claiming of space articulated by the late poet Gloria Anseldúa, who wrote, what I want is an accounting with all three cultures, white, Mexican, Indian. I want the freedom to carve and chisel my own face, to staunch the bleeding with ashes, to fashion my own gods out of my entrails, and if going home is denied me, then I will have to stand and claim my space, making a new culture, una cultura mestiza, with my own lumber, my own bricks and mortar, and my own feminist architecture." End quote. Both Fernandez and Aguilar reclaimed that space through the mestiza, mestizo body. The latter put her own body on the line to question the 19th century visuality of photographic practice that claimed the American West whereas Fernandez rendered those chiseled and heroic faces to counter the arbitrary lines on the map and the medium of printmaking used to distribute their colonial logic of exclusion. Fernandez's allusion to mestizaje, however, is much more of an abstraction. The art historian Holly Barnett Sanchez noted how the subject of mixed race manifested itself as a hybrid formally, conceptually, and aesthetically in her work. The formal choices of layering as if building a palimpsest allude to the present as well as the historical memory of the region from Spanish colonialism to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo to the establishment of the Border Patrol. On display in the exhibition upstairs is one of Fernandez's most ambitious print installations, which she made the following year in 2014. Morning and Dreaming High, Con Mucha Fe, is a large wall installation in the form of a Jerusalem cross made up of 18 individual prints. The artist used large sheets from an 18th century volume on state trials and proceedings of crimes and misdemeanors published in London. And I've got the cover here, and here she is showing my assistant in her studio, uh, what the book looks like. And I want to encourage all of you to look at this work very closely because it's remarkable how she manipulates the surface and creates so much texture into these um, prints that have litho transfers, etching, relief, and sewing. The meticulous work took four years to complete and evinces Fernandez's broad experience with artist books and her affinity for the materiality of paper. The portraits that you see are those of her students whom she photographed that we saw referenced in caution, dreamers in or on site. Through their enlarged black and white photos that have been intensely manipulated through various print techniques, their likeness begins to fade, sometimes to the point of inscrutability. Their aged appearance references archival histories of government documents, passports, visas, national ID cards, which these subjects presumably carry in the hopes of one day being granted the coveted green card as permanent residents. Their faces printed over this English law book documenting crime seems to suggest an outcry of how immigration has come to be criminalized in the US. The cursive writing overlaid on four of the prints references the, the Codex Mendoza, a 16th century document written two decades after the fall of Tenochtitlan and commissioned by the Viceroy Antonio de Mendoza to relay detailed information about the Aztec Empire, its economy, and organization. For the artist, the Codex Mendoza represents, quote, a permanent reminder of the conquest and the relationship of dominator and dominated that persists when there are conditions of inequality, end quote. 
Through these allusions to this colonial document, Fernandez makes visible the hand of the priest who translated the Nahuatl inscriptions by indigenous artists that carry detailed information on the structure, economy, and customs of the Aztec people. Curator Carmen Ramos makes note that the prints are installed in the shape of a Jerusalem cross, as I mentioned, presenting the dreamers as the new crusaders. But I would like to entertain the idea that the reference to the crusades and the Jerusalem cross is not about the dreamers, but in fact about how the ideology of manifest destiny is built on the same epistemology that led Europe to conquer Jerusalem and usurp the surrounding lands from Islamic control. The Crusades were military expeditions led by European Christians who, under the banner of the Roman Catholic Church, sought to reclaim the Holy Land. In the Chronicles of Fulker of Chartres, a priest who participated in the First Crusade, we see how the settler colonial epistemology justifies the siege and territorial possession. He writes, He who was born a stranger is now as one born here. He who was born an alien has become as a native. Those who were poor in the Occident, God makes rich in this land. Those who had little money there have countless Byzants here, and those who did not have a villa possess here by the gift of God a city. Therefore, why should one return to the Occident who has found the Orient like this? God does not wish those to suffer want who with their crosses dedicated themselves to follow him." End quote. In the history of the Crusades, we find another blueprint for the colonial enterprise that will play out in the territorial expansion of the continental US and will justify the taking of land and the slaughtering of indigenous people as a divine providence. Fulker writes that 10,000 were beheaded in the Temple of Solomon. Fernandez's overlapping of these systems of colonization as a history that repeats itself, nonlinear but informed by multiple temporalities, is very much aligned with how Jose Clemente Orozco envisioned the epic of American civilization. In Orozco's initial proposal to Dartmouth, he stated the subject of his mural would be, quote, the forces constructive and destructive which have created the patterns of human life in the Western Hemisphere. End quote. Those forces that forged and divided Terra Nova, the fourth continent, during the age of exploration and conquest into what became the overlapping colonialities of Anglo America and Hispano America were foretold in the Mesoamerican myth of Quetzalcoatl. In the myth, a deified leader of a great Toltec civilization is banished from the kingdom for malicious behavior. He vows to return to destroy those who rejected him. Cortes's arrival to the Aztec imperial city of Tenochtitlan in 1519 was later conceived as the return of Quetzalcoatl. Since the Aztecs traced their genealogy to the Toltec and it became a foundational part of the Mexican national narrative. The myth becomes a way to organize the epic for Orozco, not into a before and after, but into an Ouroboros, where the plumed serpent of Quetzalcoatl re returns time and time again to wreak havoc, where violence becomes episodical and inevitable. Mary Coffey calls it an anti-historicist approach, which he brings to life through a sequence of montages that the viewer must perform like a theatrical tragedy. The heterotemporality and palimpsestic nature of his work and these allusions to the cyclical nature of history is likewise present in the work of Fernandez and Duffy. When I asked Duffy why he envisioned Manifest Destiny in Marlboro Country, he said, this is the way it has to be because it's the same old story, it's the same old conquest, it's the same old condition. It's just been relabeled in a more contemporary time, but it's the same anguish, it's the same emotion. Now, there are also instances when Orozco Specter directly appears to be summoned by these artists, such as in Duffy's mixed media painting, He Seduced Mother, which also speaks of conquest and environmental destruction. I point to these parallels because it helps us to see that the work of these artists is part of a broader intellectual history in which Latin American and Latinx artists have been at the vanguard of questioning narratives of American exceptionalism, as well as the fraught racial hierarchies that were firmly put in place after colonization across the Western Hemisphere. 
Coffee explains that melancholy of race as a loss, either by assimilation or annihilation, is what we observe when Orozco contrasts white Anglo-Saxon America with mestizo or mixed race Latin America. And I wanted to remind you that it's that melancholic loss of indigeneity that drives Duffy to animate the mound of skulls as the return of the repressed. Coffee likewise reminds us that Orozco's views as a raceless mestizo likely changed after crossing the border and being racialized as a Mexican immigrant in the US black-white racial imaginary. We can only speculate that a borderlands consciousness was emerging for Orozco who found himself in 1930s New England painting his epic. His centering of race, racism, mestizaje, and the myth of racial purity are also important touchstones for these Latinx artists. In Michael Menchaca's, for example, 2019 series, La Raza Cosmica 20XX, which is currently on view at the Benton Museum at Pomona College, the site of another famous Orozco mural, Prometheus, we see how Menchaca turns toward 18th century painting traditions of colonial Mexico. The anxiety about racial mixing, particularly the dilution or contamination of purity of blood principles, prompted the Spanish crown to devise a system where they could name and track new world racial mixtures. These racial types, or castas, with their differing skin tones, dress, and occupations, alluded to a hierarchical ethno-racial class system that privileged whiteness and favored Spaniards and the Creole elite. The San Antonio-based artist, uh, Michael Menchaca, who is non-binary and uses they, them pronouns, remixes the archive of Spanish casta paintings with their own cast of animal archetypes, whom I'm sure you've seen in the exhibition upstairs. These half-human, half-animal creatures of feline, elephant, avian, or archetypes of Mesoamerican codices reproduce to create new racial hybrids, which Menchaca assembles into three class categories. The visual excess of Menchaca's patterning collapses time and space in these images, but there is a recurring iconography pointing to digital technologies, specifically social media apps, which seem to structure new economic and hierarchical relationships among the figures. Menchaca's printmaking trajectory carries on the spirit of questioning structures of power, but completely revamps the iconography of the protest poster with the aesthetics of, and narratives of the internet. He noted in our interview, I have always admired the prints of those legendary Chicano artists of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and how they were responding to the oppressors and their methods of their time. What I am responding to in my current prints is the unprecedented power that big tech companies assert over communities of color and presenting them as the new conquistadors doors of our time. I recognize that in the present, digital literacy is required of us and therefore I apply that digital sensibility within the production of my prints, something that I hope will provide some distance from the previous generation of printmakers." End quote. Car artists like Menchaca are waging war with techno-capitalism and its ability to spread misinformation. Despite the utopian belief in cyberspace's democratic function, the internet has become the fastest image reproduction machine, capturing, replaying, and transmitting ideas about belonging. The January 6th attack on the US Capitol is a, one such recent flashpoint where we saw how the far right used digital tech networks to organize an insurrection, claiming the 2020 election results were fraudulent. The conspiracy theories of the Proud Boys Oath Keepers, which circulated on these apps, motivated hundreds of protesters to use violence and lay siege to the building while Congress was in session. One of Menchaca's prints in the exhibition invoked the fourth approach I, ad I identify in the book of aqueous territorialities, recoding geographic representations from the view of those who experience water boundaries. And in this case, they are describing the liminal space of the Rio Grande. The river, which originates in Colorado and makes its way down to the Texas-Mexico border until reaching the Gulf of Mexico, is witness to thousands of migrant crossings each year, some of which result in drownings. 
His screen print, Cuando el Río Suena Gatos Lleva, is a humorous representation of what is generally a very somber subject. In the print, a large number of cats who are dressed in Mexican sarapes and sombreros attempt to make their way across a river that the artist abstracts into a pale blue flat background with wavy white lines that represent water currents. The cats look directly at the viewer. Their large mustaches and whiskers animate their frozen and fearful expressions. Some of the cats appear to be avid swimmers while a few are struggling to stay afloat and one is completely submerged, the only evidence of its presence a squiggly cat's tail rising from the water. Mencheca began this series of gatos during his undergraduate years at Texas State University San Marcos, where they learned printmaking with Jeffrey Dell, Brian Johnson, and Elvia Perrin. The idea for the series came from an everyday interaction in their home. Their mother fed the stray cats in the neighborhood, and they noticed how they grew dependent on her care and kept reproducing. Menchaca warned her that she needed to stop doing this, and that in that moment realized they were repeating the anti-Mexican, anti-immigrant rhetoric, rhetoric so pervasive in mainstream media. The cartoon-like characters are also engendered a disturbing and racist question during a group critique. Why does this, why does this cat have a dirty Mexican mustache? At this point, Menchaca realized the icon could reveal behaviors and attitudes on xenophobic territoriality and racism. They began incorporating cats as well as other animals like the coyote into prints as stand-ins for the marginal, outcast, racial other. These animals perform stereotypical roles in exaggerated form in order to destroy these representations with humor. Much like Orozco's epic, Menchaca's work enacts a counter-narrative to the white supremacy of US racial hierarchy, to the myth that we are a nation of immigrants instead of a settler state built on slavery and genocide, and to the myth of the American dream which so many immigrants come to pursue only to find out that it does not matter how hard you work when whiteness is the marker of belonging. In closing, we are seeing more and more how contemporary artists, such as the Dominican-American Fidele Baez, whose work is currently on view at MoMA, employ these strategies to undo the epistemic violence of how geography, identity, and race became fixed during the colonial period and created the structural inequality of our post-colonial state. My book makes the case that reclaiming the Americas has been a long-standing political project central to Latinx art, and that in the field of printmaking, we find its most fervent examples in how these artists took back a reproductive medium and used it to create alternative representations of territory and belonging. This desire to build a politics of territory for Latinx peoples in the US is motivated by their migration and settlement histories, as much as by the rise in xenophobic discourse that renders them permanently foreign. In this journey that I've laid out for you from Terra Nova to Aslan, I hope you also notice the complexities and paradoxes embedded in these artistic representations that often claim decolonial intent while unintentionally reproducing the settler colonial logic of the vanishing Indian or the assimilation toward whiteness paradigm of mestizaje. Nevertheless, the work of these artists is indebted to the conceptual breakthroughs that we saw in Orozca's mural, the cyclical view of history, the use of myth, the melancholy of race, and helps us to see how their work forms part of this long-standing tradition in Latin American and Latinx art of questioning national narratives. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that talk, Tatiana. That was wonderful. And I love how you are framing a kind of historical continuity argument between the epic of American civilization and the prints that you're talking about in terms of this kind of critical framework. But I also wonder, I want to ask you a big question and kind of just let you talk about your, your, your objects a bit and how you got into them. And it's a medium question. Um, what is, what, what is unique in print in terms of setting up these critical frameworks that's different? 
-hmm. and what drew you to print and what is what is it about reproducibility and works on paper that enhance the critical framework and what is it that's kind of specific to print as a medium so I guess it's a media studies question for you and I love it thank you <laughs> thank you Katie um, that's a great question because you know it's very hard to come see the Orozco mural right I I mean uh, took me six hours to take the bus from New York City. Uh, it's, it's a treasure, but it's not a mural that everyone will get to see, right? And I think that's one of the major differences to, to work in the print medium, um, to focus on artists that um, work in this tradition is, is that their work is so easily distributable. Um, it creates multiple audiences, right? It, it has a, a very long kind of afterlife. Um, and that really interested, interested me when I started this project. Um, I'd say that I became a specialist in, in this field um, in, in a very organic way. I, I started working with a group of artists in Sacramento called the Royal Chicano Air Force. Um, when I was an undergrad, I was um, an art studio major like some of you, and I learned how to silkscreen with, with this group. And then once I started to travel around the country, I realized that uh, this medium that they loved and that they had used to organize um, for the United Farm Worker Movement, that that had happened in so many different cities and places across the country. and. Um, and that helped me kind of start to map out this whole print network that had developed since the early 70s. Um, and what I, what I loved is that, yeah, the, there, was a, there was a preciousness to the prints, but there was also a non-preciousness, right, in that, in that um, they, they had this very far-reaching kind of distribution in these networks. Um, and I got to meet many collectors in the process and, and see them at different institutions. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of what's really powerful about the show that's upstairs, right? Printing the Revolution, um, is that some of those works were created for mass mobilization campaigns. Um, and now that we're, we're getting to see them in a very new light as these kind of precious objects, right? Um, within the museum space. Oh yeah, thank you for that question. So the caution sign is super interesting. I, I did some digging and it was designed by a Native American graphic designer. His name is John Hood. And he worked for Caltrans in the late 80s, early 90s. And he was tasked with coming up with a sign, a new road sign that could alert drivers um, because they were having so many fatalities in Southern California and highways. And what I found is that, that, um, that was so interesting is that there were other native writers who had written about this artist and had thought about this sign and had said that maybe in some ways it also alluded to John Hood's history as a as a Navajo man who, whose family or, or ancestors had also been displaced, right, had also gone through land dispossession, um, and that perhaps some of that is unconsciously there. And I found it fascinating how, you know, artists like Duffy um, then <laughs> appropriate the imagery, right, and, uh, and put it to use in other political modes as well. And we saw it again in, in Sandra Fernandez's work where she transforms in it and it's the graduates running, right, um, toward graduation. So yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you, Shireen. 
Um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, and I, I have lots of questions. But one of the things that I wanted to ask you so in, in um, pairing Fernandez and Menchaca with Duffy, you're sort of putting two side by side two slightly different generations of, of yeah. artists whose relation, whose understanding of the questions around, the qu ethical questions you're asking around the, the deployment of mythology and the appropriation of indigeneity or the um, uh, uh, projection of indigeneity are, are different. And I wondered if you could just say more about <laughs> Um, the 90s, the early 90s versus, you know, the mid to late 2000s or, or early, I guess we're in the 2020s now. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, two really different moments in terms of how artists um, and particularly Latinx artists are understanding their relationship to those um, uh, colonial legacies. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was trying to get back to the artist slideshow. There it is. So... I, I almost think of them as three generations, to be honest with you, because Duffy's born early 50s, Fernandez is 64, and Menchaca is 85. Um, and it's, you know, Ricardo Duffy is, um, you know, half Mexican-American, half Irish-Lithuanian, um, and came of age during the Chicano movement, was sort of indoctrinated in, in, into that, um, working with artists in, in Los Angeles and, you know, being active. I, he was he was in high school when the student walkouts were happening in East LA. Um, so that's very much part of the context that he grew up with. And for him, Aslan was, was this like, Utopia, this this beautiful belief um, that allowed for Chicanos to have a, a rightful claim, right, to the lands of the Southwest. Um, and I think for Fernandez, who is Ecuadorian, born in New York, you know, raised in Quito, and then came back, completely different context, right? She has more of a view from the South. Um, and for her, she tries to wrestle with these ideas around mestizaje, right, which um, she grew up bit believing in, but, you know, at the same time sees some of the realities behind um, the racist paradigms that, that are embedded within them. And I think for Menchaca, uh, much younger generation, there's... Also for an artist who identifies as non-binary, um, I, I think that there's less of an interest in um, some, some of these cultural nationalist uh, icons, right? Like Aslan, um, because it, it also feels as if Aslan kind of failed, uh, you know, feminist and, and queer um, identified people in a way. And, and so I, I see their work moving away from that. Um, and that's true for a lot of um, younger artists, Felipe Baeza, for example, uh, who are also kind of, um, I think in some ways they, they respect what that generation did and how powerful that was, but also, uh, feel like it doesn't represent who they are right now. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, I had a similar question as, as Mary, but I'm curious about how demographically Latinos have changed so dramatically since Duffy's time and since the Chicano movement. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, um, with the rise of um, indigenous people from Latin America that now are integrated into this thing called Latinx, Latine, whatever it may be, you know, two or three or 10 years from now, but it, it's changed in terms of its relationship to the indigeneity with indigenous Latinx being very present. And so I wondered if that, the, you know, just the composition of who is creating art um, has changed the ways in which people 
make claims to indigeneity? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I, I do think it has, and I think that we are seeing, well, I've been living in LA for, for this Getty Fellowship, and I've become much more aware of artists from Oaxaca, Zapotec culture, um, who are extremely active, and Pavela Acevedo is one that I've been following closely, um, whose iconography is, is really from that region, right? And um, the way they conceived of, of, of animals as being um, kind of spirits. And um, I think that we are seeing scholars do some very important work around this, Maylee Blackwell, um, and they're thinking about it as critical Latinx indigeneities, right? That it's not necessarily, um, that we have to maybe separate this from the kind of mythos of Aslan that was happening in the 60s and 70s um, and think about these are migrants, right, that, that are coming that um, are from southern Mexico, from Guatemala, from Maya areas, heavily Maya areas, and they bring their own, you know, languages and customs and traditions. The Gelaguetza is huge in California, I'm learning, um, for Zapotec communities. So I think that that kind of creates a, a, a very new system to think about how these are, are folks who are indigenous but had to migrate, right, many for economic reasons, and that we, um, and, and they certainly have this, this kind of authenticity, <laughs> right, um, in terms of, of their racial representation. Um, and perhaps that doesn't create the same kinds of problems that we're seeing with appropriation in earlier generations. Um, but it, it's, we have overlapping indigeneities, right, uh, in these cities like LA um, and in and, and the greater Southwest. And I think it'll be interesting to see what kind of conversations come up with, like what other Native American groups, you know, feel like um, and, and how they talk to each other or how they um, sort of commingle within this space because uh, in some ways they are also settlers, right? Uh, these new immigrants that are coming. Um, and I, it's a very complicated situation. Yeah. But thank you for asking that. Um, my question kind of touches on the previous one a bit. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the idea of Atslan and like through ta because it's ties to indigeneity within the Southwest, how that might be complicated if it is by um, artists who are working within geographical regions like in the U.S. whose ties to indigeneity are like very different from that of the Southwest, like artists working within like the plain states mm -hmm. or the, um, you know, like the Northeast. Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. And are you specifically thinking of, of this um, first generation? Just kind of in general. In general, okay, okay. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find like specific examples that I could point to. In terms of the Midwest, the Plains, um, there's, there's an artist by the name of Carlos Barberena, who is Nicaraguan, based in Chicago. 
um, and amazing uh, lino cut artists. And he is thinking a lot about immigration, um, but also some of these recent immigrants that are indigenous. Um, and he uses, he uses some of that imagery in his work um, to kind of point to their migration histories, but, but also the fact that the US has always been involved in, in, these, in these regions um, like Central America. Uh, in terms of how that overlaps with, with um, Native American groups in those areas, that gets a little bit harder because um, I haven't seen much interaction, right, with other artists from the Plains or... Um, so I, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, but it, it is a very good question. I think there's one more in the back. Hi, I have kind of like a hopeful question maybe to end. Um, I think you identified a lot of really interesting parallels between Roscoe's epic and like these three artists. I think another thing that stands out to me about his mural though is like the opportunity for redemption and like the hope that comes with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious in like these three artists or any other people you talk about in your book, like do you see that or do you just like I don't know, is it a lot of the harmful things that you're talking about, about perpetuating <laughs> ethnonationalism, or is there some hope along with Orozco's painting? Oh, great, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I do think that there are glimmers of hope in, in um, like a, I see their work as pointing to these decolonial horizons, right, in which th there's a possibility out of, of this, um, I did talk a, a lot of, of a lot of heavy subjects, <laughs> um, but I think our I think these artists are pointing to how our lives are, are so circumscribed by these colonial realities that are still with us, right? In 2023, um, the way our gender, the way our race, the ways our class, like all of these things. Um, and, and it's hard to sometimes see a, a way out. It, it almost feels like inevitable and episodical and that it's just gonna keep happening. Um, but, you know, Mary Coffey talks about modern industrial man um, above the reserves room as, as being this maybe possible glimmer of hope, right, in, in which um, viewers could, could identify with this racialized subject and, and, and see themselves in that, um, in this kind of new project of, of what America could look like. <laughs> and I see that in the work of, of these artists at times. Um, they're, you know, um, I think m many of you have been upstairs and, and seen Michael's work and, and the way that he plays uh, with all this iconography and um, gets you to think about stereotypes, but, but how, to, how, to, how to undo them in a way, right? Like, I, I think that's hopeful as well. Um, but yeah, thank, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> 